Good morning, everybody. It is great to see you out here. Nobody wants to sit out here in the sun? No, in the shade where it's nice Plenty and cool. Plenty of seats up front. Plenty of seats up front, just like inside. Hey, we're glad that you are here worshiping at the 9 a.m. Gender Road Christian Church service. We are out front and outdoors today. Good to see everyone. Hi, Tana. So um, we're going to be back out here on the second Sunday in August, which I'm sure will be a lot cooler in August. Um, so, you know, this is a casual, fun service. You can bring your pet, your breakfast. We got donut holes, coffee, ice water back there. And a big thank you to Josh, our sound guy underneath this tent. Uh, he makes all of this happen. And for those that got here early to help set up and stuff like that, we definitely really appreciate it. So there are, should be in your bulletin a lyrics sheet for you to sing along with if you'd like, or you could just listen to that. Today we're talking about the Good Samaritan and um, a little bit of a different take on the Good Samaritan parable and that story, but hopefully it's a story you've heard before and we'll cover that a little bit. So we have a couple new songs today. You heard one, Spirit in the Sky. We have another one that we'll be doing a little bit later too. So it's my prayer and my hope that this week you are blessed by God, that you've been thinking about uh, this past week. How is your life different that you are a Christian? How is your life different that you're a Christian? Also, that you've been thinking about your butt. No, not your behind, but the butts that we talked about two weeks ago. That butt that always seems to get in the way of us uh, trying to do the will of God, trying to learn and so forth. So we want to keep that in the forefront of our minds. So my friends, it's good to worship with you. We're able to do so because we have a Savior who loves us, who is able to have victory over death, victory over sin. And that's what this song is about. Our scripture reading, if you have your Bibles, you can take those out. And so it's in the Gospel of Luke. And so this is the parable of the Good Samaritan, which I challenge you when we read the text, tell me if you hear the word good in the story. Uh, you may remember that just a few weeks ago when Jesus and the disciples were traveling, they were going to go through Samaria and they rejected them. And so the disciples said, do you want us to call down fire and destroy them to consume them? And Jesus said, no. Well, here we are a little bit later in the story. And so Jesus brings up this parable and includes the Samaritans. So just a way for Jesus to remind us that uh, just because we may not like somebody, they are still a child of God, and that God certainly has affection and love for them, and we should not be wanting fire to consume them. Correct? Correct. All right. So let's read chapter Luke, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. So just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now when we read this, we often want to read into this. This, this lawyer was... Um, combative or maybe trying to trick Jesus, but really when you look at this text, that is not exactly so. Um, definitely within the Jewish tradition, there was a lot of questioning, and questioning is good because without questions, you don't have answers. And so there is a questioning, and justify himself, I think we can also see that we do a lot of that too, right? We try to justify ourselves, explain our actions, rationalize, and so he's trying to figure out then, who is my neighbor? So to that answer, Jesus gives this parable to help teach. He says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now we're at the third person. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity, and he went to him and bandaged his wounds, 
having poured oil and wine on them, and then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. So Jesus asks, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. So I think that's a pretty clear command for us to go and do likewise. In case you haven't tried the donut holes, they are okay to eat. I had a few, but I was not able to try one out of each box. But uh, the day's still early, isn't it? So when we look at the scriptures that are before us, let's take a moment and uh, let the, the prayers and the words of the songs that we've seen kind of settle into our spirit and the scripture that we heard and pray that God's spirit moves in us and helps us hear this. God, as we are here, I ask that you illuminate our hearts and our minds. Lord, may your spirit move within us so, Lord, that what I say what people hear are your words, Lord, move in us strongly. Move in us strongly. Amen. Okay, so did anybody hear in this parable the word good? So why do we call it the Good Samaritan? Anybody know? Well, I'm not really sure either. I mean, the person is in essence good. I think we can agree to that. But that's just something that we, when you read your Bible, when you read the scriptures, that you make sure you are paying attention to the words that are there. And so I was looking at this, and um, have have the majority of us heard the story, the parable of the the Good Samaritan, right? Kind of shaking some heads there. We've we've kind of heard this story. We, We know what happens. It's often used as a way to moralize for us our behavior, how we should act, how we should respond into this world. But if you look at it, there's a number of different characters, right? There's these religious people, the Levite and the priest. There's the Good Samaritan. We don't know what this person does. He's traveling along. We have the person that was robbed. We have the bandits. We have the innkeeper. So when we really start looking at all that, right, there's a lot of characters in the story. And so we can hear it in a different way. Maybe we relate a little bit. And so what I started thinking of was the guy who was helped, a person who was robbed, what was that like for him? What was it like for him after this whole ordeal? What if he didn't like Samaritans? And now he has that person helping him, right? And he's probably in a position where he, he couldn't really, at least initially, refuse the help. And then after he has been helped so graciously, how does he live his life after that? Does it change him? I I don't know. So we kind of look at this, and then, you know, before the the parable even starts, there's this dialogue between Jesus and this lawyer, Jesus and this person. And we have in the Gospel of Luke where there are people questioning Jesus. Um, Some are testing him. Some are asking questions, just like we would ask questions. Well, what do you mean? What What do I have to do to inherit the eternal life? All right, so we're going to get into that a little bit. And we'll see if those sirens make it all the way by us. So, but I want you to hear the scriptures within the context of the things that we've been talking about the last two Sundays, right? So what was the questions that we had for the last two Sundays? How are your lives different? How is your life different because you are a follower of Jesus than maybe they would have been otherwise? So think about what you do now, what you experience. Would your life be different if you weren't a follower of Jesus Christ? Another way to look at that is what is God doing in your life these days? From June 30th, a couple weeks ago, we had the story of the butts, right? We had the butt video. I was going to do this, but then this happened. I was going to buy that, but then this. I was going to read my Bible, but this happened, right? So we had that whole realization that we all deal with these buts in our life. But what if we turn that around? 
What if God said, well, I was going to help you, but I was tired? What if God said, I was going to heal you, I was going to help you out with that low place that you were in, but I was busy, I was distracted, but I had these texts coming in, so I forgot about you. Then last week, too, we had where the clear commands, where Jesus had sent out the disciples, you know, he said that the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. Go out and proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. Go out and say, peace be upon this house. And if people really reject you, don't want to deal with you, then that's all right. Just shake it off. Shake off the dust. It's so hard to say shake it off without thinking of that Taylor Swift song, isn't it? Yes. Anyways. How are you? So anyway, so we shake off that dust. You shake it off. Live in peace, rejoice in the right things. All right, so we hear that. And then we also remember, too, that the Luke, the gospel writer, is helping us understand that this whole Jesus is teaching. He has this message, and even the disciples can start to jump ahead to get a little confused and preoccupied, right? Because it was in Luke chapter 9 where he said he sent messages ahead of him, you know, prepare the way. But Jesus' face was set towards Jerusalem. They entered into the village of Samaritans to make ready for Jesus, but they did not receive him. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus rebuked them and said, no. So we hear all this. Because on Sunday after Sunday, when you come here, I don't want us just thinking, okay, well, here's a message today. Here's a message this Sunday. How do you see it as a progression throughout the whole year? So throughout 2019, we're focusing on back to the basics, which means as you are growing in your spiritual faith, as you're, as you're traveling in your spiritual journey, as you're understanding who you are and how you're transforming and becoming this person who follows Jesus Christ, how do you see this connectedness, this weaving in and out of the message that you hear Sunday after Sunday, or if you come to the Monday night services, whatever that may be, but we don't want you just forgetting what happens on a Sunday morning, that these messages sort of stay with you. All right, so G this lawyer asked Jesus the question, what must I, must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus refers back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus 19, gives the right answers on how to inherit eternal life, which is you shall, you know, talks about loving the Lord your God and, and worshiping God and having no other... Um, the false gods before you, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so this question comes up, and I think it's a good one. The lawyer says, well, who is my neighbor? I think we could all ask that question. Who is my neighbor? Because maybe your neighbor is someone that's within physical proximity to you, right? They live close to you. Maybe the neighbor is more of a social proximity. It's somebody that you interact with. Maybe you don't interact with anybody near you, but socially, someone that's close to your age. But also, too, what if someone could be your neighbor whom you hardly know? The Samaritan did not know this person that he helped. He knew him for just a very short amount of time. But Jesus still refers to that person as our neighbor. Because it's easier for us sometimes to help somebody we know, that we have a good relationship with, or maybe somebody that we think will appreciate it. But we don't know what happened here. It was a short amount of time. We don't even know the age difference between the Samaritan and the person he helped. So there were three people, the Levite and the priest and the Samaritan, all were familiar with the Torah all understood this clear command of what they were to do in terms of loving God and loving neighbor. They knew what was expected of them. Yet, as we kind of talked about last week, they rejected. Because Jesus says, if they reject you, they reject me and they reject the one who sent me. Because when we look at the truth of it, sometimes we don't like it when the kingdom of God draws near. Because when the kingdom of God draws near, that's another way of saying the Holy Spirit's sort of right there, moving within your spirit, moving, uh, you know, sort of whispering in your ears, that voice you're hearing in your head, which is trying to guide you. But yet you really want to do something. You really want to buy something. You really want to say something. You really want to go somewhere. You really want to participate in that. And so it's like, eh, 
well, maybe the kingdom of God is near, but it's not that near, so I can go ahead and do this. Those things that happen that way. So two out of the three did nothing, but all three had what in common? They saw the man in the ditch. What do you see as you go through your day? What do you see as you go through your life? So by seeing, we recognize. By seeing, we understand. What do we see and then choose to act upon or not? Now, when we look at the scripture too, how many things did the Good Samaritan do? If you look in the, in the scriptures, how many acts of kindness did the Good Samaritan do? I counted at least six. So go back in there and see, because he had to stop, he had to bandage him up, he had to dress his wounds, he had to take him to the inn, he had to give money. So the, it wasn't just like, hey, I'm going to give you a ride somewhere. No, I'm going to take time. There's going to be an impact to my day, a deviation to what I have planned, because I'm going to act in a way because I saw you and I realized that you are my neighbor. So why do I ask all these questions? Because I believe they deal with your butts. I believe you deal with your butts, the butts that we all have, right? But I just don't have enough time. But I'm just not sure. But what would happen if I really did that? See, there's no excuses given in the scripture by Jesus nor Luke, the gospel writer, to relieve the Levite and the, and the priest from their responsibilities of how they were supposed to have acted. And then Jesus gives what clear command at the end of this scripture? Go and do likewise. So for 2,000 years, we are to go and do likewise. Nothing changes. So this concept of us being neighborly, this concept of us being helpful, this concept of us as being Christians, this concept of us as our hearts turn to having a heart for people, it's not new. It's not revelatory to you. This is something that has been part of God's plan for humanity, written into the Torah, written into the New Testament, exemplified by the life of Jesus Christ, given for us, that we are to go and do likewise. And so we start thinking, well, how will that take shape in my life? We're to go and do likewise, but also do we pass by? And I ask that question because it's thought-provoking, and it's thought-provoking and challenging me to me as well. When do we choose to pass by? When do we choose to see but not respond? Because, see, I look about and I keep thinking, what is it that we can be doing in our community? How can we be making an impact? And how can you, as you come here on a Sunday morning, be emboldened, strengthened, encouraged, Recognize you have the power of the Holy Spirit with you so that when you go out into the world, you're being an awesome Christian. You're being an awesome follower of Jesus for the people that you're in contact with. And sometimes that may just be the person that you live with that's in the same house as you. And then maybe once that's going okay, maybe it's sometimes then the people you start to work with, you go to school with. See, sometimes we think too big. We're starting to think, well, I'm gonna have to change the world. No, let's change our hearts to have a heart for people, and let's change our hearts to have a heart for the people that we're living with, that we're going to church with, where we can show grace and mercy. Because our relationship with God extends outward towards one's neighbors. Our relationship with God extends outwards towards one's neighbors. So if we look at what Jesus said in Matthew 22 and in Mark 12, when Jesus was asked, what are the greatest, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds in Matthew chapter 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's not, it's not confusing. It doesn't change. It's loving God and loving neighbor. And sometimes that means you gotta check yourself. You gotta humble yourself. You gotta understand, look inside, what's going on? What am I upset about? What am I holding a grudge about? Where am I holding some prejudicial thoughts or racist thoughts or, or just you know, thoughts that aren't 
in line with where we need to be in following God's will. I also raise this too because a lot of times we can hear the words or the the reasons or the buts, the excuse of, well, you know, church is good or all this and you know all this and that, but it all comes down to your personal relationship with Jesus. And people will say, well, I don't need to go to church. You do. There's no, there's no denying it here that you are to love God and love others. And you're not loving others if you are not out and about and doing things and going to places where you are fed. Because when we really look at it, every time we hear those sayings, it comes into another but, right? Well, I was, I'd like to go but. And so when we, and I raise this issue because my guess is you've had this conversation. You may have even said it yourself. When we're talking with, with folks, how can you continue to listen and to talk with them, which helps them move past, thank you, which helps them move past where they are in terms of their, of their excuses and so forth? Because it's more than, yes, at the core of it is you and your relationship with Jesus, but it's more about that. It's not just about your preference for a certain style of worship music or commun- way communion is served or the color of the carpet and so on. It's about engaging in the mission of Jesus Christ. It's about engaging in the mission of the body of Jesus and the church, the here and now. It's about seeing what is happening around you and your need to do something about it. So let's go back to the person in the ditch. Because this person in the ditch, when we look at it, really, I think, can be an example of when we're in those low places. Because that person in the ditch, when the people saw him, they passed by. Have you ever been forgotten? Maybe you feel like nobody sees you, understands you, recognizes you, right? You're in that low place in your life. Yet here comes Jesus time and time again trying to give you help to lift you up. But there are times where we do feel left out, forgotten, beaten up, left in the ditch, no one to talk to, lonely, forsaken. We're there. And someone comes to help us. Are we willing to accept that help? Sometimes we're too proud or we don't want to put trouble out. But can we humble ourselves and accept that grace that God is giving to us? What can we learn from that experience of interacting or receiving help from someone that we may not really know, someone that we may not really like, someone we're not really sure of maybe what all those intentions are? And so I wonder too, what happened next? Did this guy really appreciate the help? Was his life changed by this? I don't know. Have you ever had something life-changing in your life? Maybe it was a really big event. Did it really change your life? You know, I'm talking a year, two years, three years down the road. Or did you go back to the same patterns, the same ways of thinking? How did it really impact who you are and what you choose to do? Remember the other week I asked, when you get out of bed, does the devil go, oh shoot, she's up? When you get out of bed, does the devil go, "Uh uh-oh, and he's already hitting the ground running? How are we ablaze on fire for this passion, for this Jesus Christ who's in our life? For a way to recognize it, and I come back to this time and time again because it helps me reset and to refocus that each day is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's a a way of understanding that, okay, no matter what happened yesterday, today is that day. I recently read a quote by a guy guy named Charles Blow, who's a columnist for the New York Times. And he writes this, one doesn't have to operate with great malice to do great harm. One doesn't have to operate with great malice to do great harm. And this speaks to me for a couple ways, because 
The Samaritan had mercy and empathy, showed great mercy for the person that was in the ditch and acted upon it. Sometimes we think the greatest harm comes by somebody who acts out violently. But when we hear this quote, one doesn't have to operate with great malice in order to do great harm. What happens when we just choose to reject what God's trying to do in our life? Or we just choose to not see and pass on by? Nobody will send you to jail because you didn't act out wrong. You just chose not to act. You just chose not to say. You just chose not to do. Just something to think about. Amen.